Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. We're here in sunny Los Angeles, of course, at Clear Lake Recording Studios. And we're gonna meet up with our, our old friend, Rayut Feldman, who has managed multiple studios in this town. And the owner, Eric. So this should be a lot of fun. Another Eric, isn't that? How many Eric's can you have? How many Eric's is too much? <laughs> no such thing. No such thing. All right, let's go and check out the studio. Rayu, how are you? Welcome to Clear Lake. <laughs> good to so see good you again. Good to see you. Come on in. Marvelous. Lead the way, please. Well, I'm glad to have you come by. Here's the man himself. Hi, Eric. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Good to see you. This is uh, the, first, the biggest studio, Studio A. That's correct. I see the centerpiece is, of course, the lovely Trident ATB. Mm -hmm. so did this come with the studio? It did. It was here originally, uh, installed in 1987. Board is originally, I think, from 83. Um, but when I first came in here, coming from Henson, which was all SSL, I originally was thinking, I didn't know much about this console. And then I started using it and just really fell in love with it for the space. It's such a tracking-focused studio. Having really anything else just didn't make sense. Um, having a, Putting an SSL in here or something like that, which is what I was most familiar with, just didn't make sense. We don't, you know, it's so tracking focused and this board is so well suited for that with the preamps and the EQs. It's just, it's perfect for the space. I can't help noticing the first thing, of course, is you've got the console, beautiful console, you've got some great outboard, all, but you actually have instruments in here as well. Yes. Yeah. We uh, like to have as much of a full back line and a couple different options in, for each category and stuff as possible. It's never ceases to amaze me when I work with bands and I tell them about whatever studio we're going to. They're cool. They're like, cool, can we use their bass amp? I'm like, actually, they don't have bass amps. You have to rent them. And for a lot of people watching that have grown up in home studios, they're probably quite confused by that. But yeah. that is sort of the normal way in, in, I suppose, L.A. and New York. Yeah. was doing that all the time. And then, so of course, it was a vibrant rental business. Yes. But it's great to go to a space now where everything's there. That's kind of what we try and provide. The biggest thing, because the biggest studios, you get a piano and maybe a B3, if you're lucky. Maybe. But yeah. Which we have. If, if there's, you know, no amps, no instruments, uh, you know, other than a piano and B3. So having some guitars, bass, guitars, different amps, keyboards. I like to just kind of have things for people to see and get inspiration from and and just enjoy playing around with. So give us a little uh, rundown on what we've got here on the outboard. For sure. Obviously we have the Series 80, so we have the ATB, we have the beautiful console, but yes. I can see you've got a lot of external mic pre's here as well. Yeah, exactly. We have a, not a super wide selection, but uh, a couple of vintage Neves. These uh, were original, uh, originally with the studio, and then we have four more BAEs, uh, the 1073, Recreations, we pretty much use them interchangeably. This Tube Tech dual preamp, which is fantastic. It's a dual tube preamp. It's amazing on bass, use it on acoustic guitar and stuff, but just really nice, clean sounding, super flat from like 20 hertz to 40K or something. I had a tech working on it and he called me up. He's like, Eric, do you know what the frequency response of this thing is? And so it's a great unit. And then the Avalon, which we don't really use for anything. You know, I used to like the 737 for the EQ. Yeah, the EQ, well, what we do use it for is scratch vocals in the control room. Because right. we just go right in the back of it. Yeah. The way this room is, is configured, there's tie lines and stuff like that are very old school. It's direct from the control, or from the live room right into the preamp. So when we need to use preamps in the control room here, we have to use outboard pre's because there's no way to patch into the console pre's from here, which is beautiful. I see you have a CL1B. Yep. Got TubeTex, uh, yeah. Poltec clone as well. Exactly. Um, this doesn't get used tons. They're great sounding units and they're very close. The CL1B is amazing. We actually just got this one in this room. We have, uh, ones in all of our other rooms. Um, we took two years of waiting to get this. The TubeTech clones don't get used a lot because we have a whole rack of, uh, Poltec. Of the originals. Yeah. EQP 1A3s and then MEQs at the bottom two of those. And the studio Wally Hyder in Hollywood was closing just before the studio opened. And so the original owner bought tons of stuff from Wally Hyder. We have lots of mics wow. Wally Hyder built. I think these light fixtures are from Wally Hyder. Our mic panels are from Wally Hyder. Um, so I believe these rack of Poltex were. Um, and then we have some original Erie 1176s. This is a hairball audio, just sort of to have a different color. Oh, I can't help. Noticing that. The vocal stresser? The vocal stresser, yeah. yeah. Just if you want to 
messed something up. It's a yeah. really great box for that and cool for a lot of different things, but a smash mono room mic or a screamy kind of crunchy vocal, um, I, it, it sounds, it's a really unique sound that I don't think anything else in our rack here does. Yeah, the, I, whenever I've messed with the, the Compex Limiter, it's like once you get it sounding good, you're like, don't touch it. Yeah, yeah. I don't think these knobs have really turned much. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Smart at the top there. Absolutely. Um, I like the way that sounds better than the you know original bus compressor for the SSL. Are you using that on your master bus? Uh, master bus, but also a lot on drum rooms. Um, if you know for tracking and stuff like that, which we do tons of. I mean, drum tracking in this room is probably one of our primary things, whether it's drums on their own or drums with a full ensemble. And these rooms, this room through uh, this compressor sounds amazing. Um, so if I'm mixing, it's also great on a mix bus. And, uh, and then reissue LA-2A distressors, standard kind of stuff, 160s. This guy's cool. It's, I think they have a reissue of it now, the Spectrosonic 610. Um, they do. I have one. Oh, really? Fantastic, yeah. What do you yeah. like to use it on? Actually, acoustic guitars, it gets used on more than anything because um, it has that very 70s acoustic guitar sound. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't really know how else to explain it. It's also great on electrics if you want that kind of Rihanna kind of... Uh, bah, 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 really bah, grabbing bah, it. Bah, 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 yeah. yeah. The attack on it is it can be insanely fast. But if you've, got a, if you've got a great strummed acoustic part, you can get the attack just right, so it almost becomes like a percussive stereo acoustic and choruses very nice yeah i think this is also another one from wally hyder um not a, not a lot of people use but people it. don't know wally hyder's studios it, i mean mark boland did get it on in wally hyder's studio there's so many great r recordings done in there i always wonder what happened to it because i wasn't anywhere near los angeles when it went under or, or closed i should yeah. say yeah and what studios weren't closing at that time no they were doing amazing they're making more than they are now in 1980s dollars. <laughs> yep. So DBX-160X is fantastic. Yep. Um, um, great on like a snare top or a bass lead vocal. I mean, yep. you, you use those, right? Yeah, I, t I tend to use it on a kick drum. Yeah, cool. Um, or the, I think it's the what, DBX, the 160A, but whichever one it is. But yeah, um, they're, they're fantastic, really, and totally inexpensive. Right, yeah, up, you can like, get these for like 150 bucks. Exactly, yeah. I don't know the Yuri's. Are they sort of PA stuff more? No, this is kind of cool. When JBL bought Yuri, this was their engineer's attempt to combine an LA-2A and 1176 in a compact, more cost-effective package. They kind of, you can get a vibe from them as if you were using both an 1176 and an LA-2A. You know, I don't think it ended up being a super successful endeavor, and I've never seen these anywhere else, to be perfectly honest. But So this might be a, a good tip to try and find online. It's a 7110, model 7110. Yeah, again, I think these, a couple hundred bucks maybe. Um, but really maybe a little bit more after this. Maybe. <laughs> um, well, that's fantastic. Course, uh, distresses the Swiss Army knife of compression. Exactly. Anything Absolutely amazing. From super tame dis compression to dis destruction. How are you finding the uh, Fairchild recreation by Stam? I really like it. Uh, if you're willing to wait in a very long time, <laughs> it took two and a half years to get that. Oh, wow. Um, but it sounds great. Uh, where I came up at Henson, there was one of those in every single room, so I'm pretty familiar with the original sound. And I've never done an AB. Um, right. But to me, it does the thing. And Close enough for jazz. Yeah, close enough for jazz, close enough for rock and roll, whatever you need. Yep. Um, and it's it's got some slight improvements. It's got a mix knob here, so that's cool. You can do built-in parallel. And then um, I believe you can also do a, a, like a high pass for the this um, detector circuit. Huge fan of Jeff Jakings. I'm glad to see you've got some of his stuff. Yeah, yeah. This is a, a really cool, again, Swiss Army knife compressor that doesn't get tons of use because it's, you know, a lot of the stuff in here is kind of the industry, industry standard. standard people it's know been around really for well. a while. And that's yeah. the fun and challenging thing when you have a studio. It's like you want to get all the cool boutique stuff that you know and you read about on the internet and you see being, you know, reviewed and like sounds awesome and it's doing something different and unique and but you need to have a space where when engineers come in, they know what they're dealing with. And so having stuff like this where it's, it's got basically the same knobs and works the same way as a, as a Fairchild. So if you know a Fairchild, you're going to be comfortable on that. But um, this, I think people shy away from a little bit, not because it's complicated, but just they're not familiar with it. So, um, But it sounds great. I've used it on snare, lead vocal. I've guitars. said this many times on, on camera when we're talking about daking, but his A-series uh, mic prees, I can't remember what the model name is, 
are some of the best mic pre's I've ever used in my life. I've always wanted to try one of the one of their consoles because they just released a relatively new version. I oh, think. they did? Yeah, a, a, a version two or Rev two of their console that has been out for a little while. That's so it was phenomenal. Yeah, it's it looks really interesting. And he is a as, a as a guy is absolutely amazing. And he came down to a session I was doing with some you know older rock stars and and they were like flipping out because he's the original drummer from a band in New York called the Blues Magoos. Oh, which were like this legendary kind of blues rock band. Cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> so he's got all the street cred in the world. Yeah, for sure. So drama? Yeah, drama, just a stereo compressor. This thing also doesn't get tons of use, but it is, it's a nice unit. I mean, it's, it's a good thing. If you're mixing on the console, you're mixing using you know, hardware inserts and stuff, having an additional stereo compressor in the rack is, is always can be useful. So effects, you've got 300 yeah. uh, L lexicon. Just enough to get us by. 300 L has all the famous patches from the 480. We have the Lark over there for control. It's, if you're familiar with the 480, then you'll be right at home with the 300. And then H3000. Love the H3000. So the uh, micro pitch and Canyon. And, uh, Amazing for micro pitch stuff. Still yeah. use it to this day. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I still don't think there's a plugin that's completely nailed it. No. And then just uh, 2290 digital delay. That one probably gets the least amount of use, but it but was classic. Yeah, when it came out, having this ability to do samples and stuff like that, it was pretty special. And then, of course, the PCM70. Yeah, PCM70. And uh, again, has a lot of classic lexicon algorithms in it. Um, so if you need a good plate, room, hall, it's all there. Yeah. Is that just a switching unit? They yeah, this, this, we used to have you know, a DAT player, a CD player, a tape player, and all that. And so I this see. was meant to switch through all that to get it to the console. And now it just sits there. <laughs> and then a little headphone amp here, too. So it's kind of the, if you're doing mixing here, as opposed to bringing in one of our headphone mixers or whatever, having a little higher quality headphone amp that can drive our you know, mixing headphones, open Amazing. and stuff. And I see we have tape as well. Yeah. Behind Lucas over here. Yes, so we got... 827. The, uh, 827, pretty much the most technologically advanced tape machine, I think, yep. that was ever made. It's, I think, the last model. I think this might be the last revision. There might have been one after it. It was, well, it was the okay. gold. Gold, 827 yes, gold. Yes. Yeah. Right. It still works. I mean, we just did a tape session last week. Good. Um, we, we don't do tons Good. of them. But yeah, we're tracking drums literally last Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. And, Amazing. Uh, and we do tape transfers. We've done transfers of entire libraries um wonderful who maintains it hasn't really needed much maintaining but in the past charlie bolus i was about to say it was a charlie yes yeah exactly and so there's been a power supply thing that went wrong or had an issue seven years ago or eight years ago and but the the motors still work great the thing can align itself so because that's i think the one tricky area of having a tape machine in a studio without a tech is you really have two hours as an un, you know non-super skilled uh, calibrator to take the time and do that. And this, we just have all of our uh, calibration saved in Pro Tools because it originally came on a reel of tape for all the different formulations and levels and stuff like that. And so we can just play it back into this and we just like hit a button right here, load. Wonderful. And then it's lined up to whatever formulation and, and alignment level wise you want. Incredible. Yeah. And then Pro Tools, I see. Yeah. So you have the HDXs. Yeah, we're running Pro Tools HDX in here have the um, the newer Mac Pro, still Intel, uh, pretty well maxed out. And since the room was a, was designed pretty specifically as a 24-track room, yep. um, originally on the patch bay, there's 24 in, 24 out. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have additional units that when we you know need to go to higher track counts, we can for tracking and stuff like that. But it's mostly built on 24 in out, but we can get up to 48 in. Superb. Yeah. And it's direct outs on every channel? Yeah, direct outs on every channel. But we still use the buses a decent amount as well. Um, for like Tom, top and bottom, uh, all that yeah, kind of stuff. and just for, for routing, save patch cables. <laughs> but it, it gives it, you know, kind of this additional sound going through this, you know, components in the console that people want to hear on an analog desk, even yeah. though back... 30 years ago when it was designed, everybody was patching around them, you know. Yeah, exactly. Nobody wanted Transformers. Yeah. They're like, no, they ruined the sound. Now we're like, bring me the Transformers. Yeah, yeah it's funny. So. So, Adam speakers. Yeah, the Adam S3Xs. I've been a personal fan of these speakers for the last 10 years or so. I've got two other pairs. I just really like them. I think 
they sound good, like they've got a nice beefy low without a sub, but I think that they translate really well, especially in this room. This room was designed by George Augsburger originally in the, in the 80s. So do we have mains in here? Yeah, and we have Yuri 813s, but Augsburger modified. Um, it's an extra tweeter. So if you want to blast your head off, you can. Yes, and we got dual 18-inch subwoofers. Oh, wow. My, Meyer subwoofers. Lovely. And a, oh, yeah, those are huge. And then, of course, pair of NS10 sitting on top. Yeah. It's not the most perfect monitor placement, but when people want to use them and actually mix on them or use them you know, properly, then we'll move either move out the S3Xs and put them in, in a better listening position. But a lot of times, they just get used to reference a vocal level, make sure things are sitting well, and you can do that with them sitting like this. But if you're going to mix on them all day, then we'll move them. And do you have other monitors to hand if people want to try other things? Yeah, out? we have some Genelex. Uh, we have, in the other room, we have PMCs, although those stay in there. And then we have some, well, new Genelex and old Genelex, the 1031s, and then like the 8050As or something. Right. And, I know both of those. That's great. Yeah. And those are the main other options we have. What's that acoustic sitting over there? Uh, this is just kind of a beater, fun to have in the room as an Alvarez. Uh, we For recording, we have a Martin D35, uh, but this is just, it's hanging on the wall. It's not super precious, but it's functional. It's nice. Yeah. It's good to have a little guitar around so you can, I like having something so I can reach and play, exactly. figure out the harmony parts and all that kind of good stuff. Exactly. And then we keep our Martin tucked away in a case. Nice. And pull it out when... So we can get into the live room from... This way, yeah. There's another door there. Does that go into it? That's just storage. No, nope. and okay. then we have our amp room in Let this show, little yeah. door. Mind the step, Eric. We got got a, you, the I knew you, you <laughs> knew it was there. I was just reinforcing what you were saying. <laughs> oh, wow. This is where the magic happens. Yeah. Excellent. So for the, the size of the room, it's fairly live. Yeah. Doesn't really prove anything, but I'm doing. Isn't that what everybody does when they walk into a studio? They go always. clap, 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 like it means I had, anything. Uh, when I first took over, I had George Augsburger come in to do some, just see if there's any other tweaks that he could do. And when he comes into a room, he goes, huh? Huh? "Oh, for the low, low end, yeah." See if any, yeah. <laughs> so he's not a clapper. He's not a clapper. A happy clapper. Yeah. But I, that was the first time I had heard anybody do that, and I was like, I guess that works. I, sp I suppose it just comes down to if you know what you're listening for, and he right. certainly does. Oh, I, lo I love this Silver Jubilee uh, mm -hmm. reissue. Head. That's nice. Uh, I had one of those when they were new. Now I feel really old. <laughs> it sounds great in an uh, AC15 so that it's easier to pick up and you don't break your back. You love AC15s, one of my yeah. favorite amps. And uh, Deluxe Reverb. And then we've got some stuff for the Shredders. A Mesa. Bog standard Session Guitar Players amp, Deluxe yeah. Reverb. Nice. And then a, a Mesa Mark V which is this guy here. I think my friend Jamie Humphreys loves those. Yeah, it's, it's like four amps in one uh, in, a, in a small frame. And I've liked the smaller heads and cab combinations because yep. you can really push it in the studio. I mean, we're in a sound-controlled space, but if somebody is here with a full Marshall stack or, or even a half stack, it still rattles the walls when that thing's, you know, full blast. It, it's, and if you're tracking a full band, you know, having something a little bit smaller that you can crank and get the tone you want, Look at the, look, the yeah. little, the mini exactly. 412. I know exactly. it's not 412, but it's quite right. a, take, take a photograph back, like, it's huge. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm a big kid when it comes to that. Lots of radial stuff. We love this stuff. Yep. Just the Built guitar extenders and reamp boxes. Great. And yeah, and all their DI boxes we love. We have some, you know, some older classic stuff as well, but. Stuart, yeah. These things are. And some whirlwinds. You can't beat a whirlwind. Yeah. Exactly. See some nice pedals down there. OCD. Yeah, I got an OCD, the um, green guy is a DS9. But this is great. You can come in here, you've got instruments, mm -hmm. got a precision, yep. got a Rhodes. And everything and everything works and you know, sounds good. Nice. This is this is cool. I found this in the attic when I was cleaning out the building when I first bought it, because there's twenty-five years worth of just junk up there. And it's just an awesome Alltech tube mixer. It's mono out. So it's really cool if you want to do a funky... But are these mic pre's? Yes, it's five-channel mic pre. Have you ever thought about getting Charlie or somebody to mod it and put direct outs on each channel? I have, and that would be cool. I think what the cha I know I've seen a number of modified ones, but you lose then the master output and the master EQ. Yeah. And so if I could find somebody that would just add the direct outs and not bypass the master section so that you still have the option of doing a, a mix into the, the master bus, right? then that would be cool. But 
You're just half normal. So if they're, if they're not putting in direct out, still goes like that. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. It's really, it's a really funky, cool sounding thing. And these mic pre's have like 90 dB of gain. It's, they're bonkers. So illumination, is that just turning the light bulb up and down? I think so, yeah. Because I think it's a, it's a PA mixer, and so it's like, if, if it's too light, you know, it's... It's in a dark room, you've got to turn it down a bit. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That's fantastic. That'd be great if that was an actual function of the mixer, though, like illumination. What does that not do? Well, maybe it adds some second and third order harmonics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I see you've got a chorus echo down there. Lovely. Yep, tape echo with all the tape bunched up in chaos, some, um, some comp, or uh, the Keypex stuff, uh, Valley people, the... Um, Gain brains and then the keypex. I used when I first came to LA in the mid '90s. Every studio I went to work in had those. Yeah, they've I, slowly I, disappeared, but yeah, because I think the gates. Well, people used to track with gates, of course. Yeah. And so now we just now we have DAWs where we can do anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We see the, racks their stuff. The gain brains are still really cool compressors. Very much so. Yeah. Avalon DI. Yeah, I love that for bass. And then there's a Kemper up there. Yeah, for I'll those that do. Yep. And got, you know, have downloaded a bunch of additional tone packs and stuff. So great. Now I love the Yuri's up here. So you could reamp back in the room if you want to get some ambience. Totally. I've put snares through there and, and reamp them. And, uh, it's, it sounds cool. Especially if you get a kit that somebody recorded in their basement or something. Right. Or at a rehearsal studio. Or well, just to make everything feel cohesive. Mm -hmm. A little bit of room on every instrument just so it feels like, oh, we actually recorded in a room, and it wasn't overdubbed in 15 different studios. Exactly, yeah. Hearback systems, Yep. just the A-channel guys, um, but they're, they're workhorses to yeah. get the job done. And one of these days, I'd probably like to upgrade to the pro ones where you get the 16 channels. But for, Right. You know, Lots of people have like little Mackie mixes because mm -hmm. then they can... Yeah, those, those are cool too, but you need somebody that's going to wire up all of the different Elko connectors. And <laughs> That's what we had at, at Henson is we had all these headphone stations that had, you know, 24 in and out or whatever on the back of them. Right. All of them had a four channel or a four rack space power amp mixer. And then, yeah. And then you just have to hope that the musician doesn't get lost. Yeah. I can't. Uh... Yep. And they were always in the tech shop. Yes. And uh, yeah, mic panel again yep. from Wally Hyder. <laughs> The first original. Oh, that's a Wally Hyder one? Yeah. When I was originally uh, looking at this place, the, the owner. That's nice. Was like Paul McCartney sang through those. Yeah, lots of incredibly famous people made records at Wally Hyder's. Yeah, a funny thing. Usually they say, you know, the Frank Sinatra mic or something like that. No, the Paul McCartney. Paul mic McCartney panel. patch bay. Yeah. Paul McCartney uh, mic panel, sorry. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then we've got our Yamaha C7 back here that uh, lives back here. But we also bring it out. Um, it's on wheels, so we can bring it out into the into the live room, and it's, great. it's really a great, great sounding piano. It can do the '80s rock, like because it was bought to do late '80s, early '90s kind of rock stuff. So it's very was originally very brightly voiced, and like slightly lacquered hammer, so you get that really kind of tingy sound. And then I had somebody. Who's your tuner? Ron Tuttle. Uh, yeah, Ron Tuttle's. We've been using. He a number of years ago went through and revoiced it, softened up all the hammers, and so it's still. A fast, really fast action, like medium, you know, loud, medium, soft. But, and you can see the keys. You're a keyboard player, so you got thrown under the bus now, you yeah. see. <laughs> I was you just trying to demonstrate. You keyboard play. Yeah. Um, but you can see that the keys show that this is an instrument that has, you know, stories in it. And so. Yeah, it's been played. Yeah. And been on lots of records and always sounds good. A lot of people come here specifically for this piano. Beautiful. Um, uh, why have you got your carving hidden in the back here, Eric? Come on. <laughs> that was actually... <laughs> Loud and proud. My, my dad was a guitar player back in his youth, and uh, so he had this you know, in the basement ever since I can remember. And uh, There was a lot. In the 80s, there was a lot of huge guitar players that used carving. Yeah, Steve Vai at some point, Steve I think, Vai, was a carving yeah. guy. Yeah. And that's the only one I know. <laughs> But that's, he's, he's still he's, pretty big. He's like 10 guitar players in right. one. So, yeah. Covers a lot of ground. Covers a lot of ground. Yeah. What, what a great musician. Yeah. Does this go out to like at the back so you can load in and exactly, out? Exactly. Yeah. We have a, and we also use this back area for, we have an amp locker and, um, and we put guitar amps and stuff. Yeah. It's Maybe kind a of a extra. cool, it's kind of a cool sounding room. Yeah. And yeah, uh, nice. so in there, it's just, it's not great film, but. <laughs> you want to, Eric, a quick poke in there? So like a dead room for amps? Exactly, yeah. And so great for bass amps, presumably. Yeah. 
and just big heavy doors and lots of absorption. Nothing fancy, not to put anybody in there. But then these doors, they open up to a big rolling door. We don't lock the inter- no. <laughs> so No, we don't. And uh, so load in is super easy for people, which is always appreciated, I think. Absolutely. I've been in many studios where you're going through a honeycomb of corridors just to, you yeah. know, just to do your bass over dub with your Ampeg. And then we have our mic locker here. I don't know if that's... Yeah, mic lockers are always interesting. Okay, cool. They are. So this is, yeah, our kind of everything um, closet, but also where we keep all of our microphones. And I think we've got a really cool collection of microphones, all the standard stuff um, going from kind of left from right. We've got 414s, ULS. We also have a pair of EBs. Actually, we have three EBs. Um, you know, sort of the, the original ones. We have a pair of newer ones at our uh, other location, which still sound fine, but the EBs kind of have a little extra something special. Uh, 451s, these are all old mics that have been here, you know, since the beginning. And AKG 460, a lot, just are kind of our small diaphragms, a couple different kick mics, D112, and then a D6 Audix, which is... Is that is, a 67 down the bottom? What's that? Yes, we've got a 67, which is our... our Pride and Joy, also, you know, original, not a reissue one. And, and that point, came with the studio when you got the studio? Yeah. Yeah, this is... Good job. <laughs> Good job. And between that and, yeah, somebody, I think, used it on toms at one point. <laughs> or maybe an overhead, but... Well, you, you know it's old when it says made in Western Germany. Exactly. And then we have that guy and another from the same, of the same sort of vintage. We have an SM2, uh, the stereo... Uh, tube mic as two KM56 capsules. I've said this many times before, so people will glaze over, but my mind was blown because I always assumed that my favorite vocal sound is like, hey, Jude, just that, hey, Jude, when it comes in. I always assumed it was a 47. Yeah. But they didn't track that at Abbey Road. Oh. I think they did that at Trident. My mind's completely forgetting. Maybe it was Olympic. But regardless, it was done on a 67. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's it sounds great on everybody. People think of it as kind of a male rock microphone, but it really sounds amazing on every style of music. Use it on hip hop, use it on female vocalists, use it on folk vocalists, you know, Great. really just about anything. And then this guy's awesome, our SM2 stereo microphone. It's, oh, beautiful. It's probably one of the more fragile microphones we have, um, just because the this mechanism at the top, you know, there's, so there's two capsules on top of each other, one that's fixed on the bottom that's pointing the direction of the cap of the badge. Or the badge yep. is, yeah, right there. And then this top one is on a rotary thing, and you can twist it like that. But it's very, very... Of course, it is a Neumann, and they've just rebranded it Telefunken for the American market, because that was the distributor in America. But right, right. if you look down there, you'll see Neumann. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and this, is, this, this one's pretty old. <laughs> I think this, this is probably the oldest microphone we have. I'm, I'm not 100% sure of its exact years, but it could be early 60s. Um, and now, your 67 is what mid late 60s probably probably yeah beautiful back in its sock and then we have a number of ribbons we have you know the Coles 4038s we have did you have a pair yep we got a pair of those Great. Royers oh some other fun older ones 121s yeah 121s yep. all that and then we have some C30s oh. there's the oh, Wally yeah. Hyder badge that's very cool we got a pair of those that's so, very very cool my understanding is this was Sony's attempt to create a U47 style microphone. Well, it's an amazing mic. Yeah, the look. I don't think it sounds anything like a U47. No, but it's still an amazing mic. Yeah, gorgeous. Yeah, I just love the Wally Hyder sticker. It's, it's interesting because in the back of my mind, I've always wondered what happened to Wally Hyder. Yeah, because I've done all these these uh, breakdowns of great songs, and oh yeah, they're either entirely recorded or partially recorded at Wally Hyder's. Yeah, over the years. Yeah, we're, we're very fortunate to have some of that stuff. Uh, old Indeed, Fat 47, yeah. our go-to, never recorded a kick drum without it. Yeah, I can tell. It's definitely, <laughs> kick drum is uh, We still use it on prevalent. vocals occasionally, but it's the way it's been used and abused over the years, it's it's definitely best suited for... It's always one of the best talking points when it comes to Neumann is, is the fact that they last forever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is... That's the proof. It's is gone through it, there, yeah. yeah. And... Um, Everything else just really standard. We have a an old eighty seven. I think this is probably a seventies eighty seven. Gorgeous. And uh, again, you can see the see the age. And then, but then we also have a, a nice new pair of eighty sevens in the box. Wonderful. 
Yeah. Are those the consecutive serial number ones? Yeah, exactly. I love how Neu Neumann is like probably the most precise microphone company in the world, but they don't call them match. They just call them consecutive, <laughs> where everybody else would call them match. Yeah, they got to be special. Yep. And let's see what else we got. We got salt shaker mic, Altec. Oh, I love these. Yeah. And great for like mono drums for that kind of exactly yeah. lo fi drum sound. And then this thing, which is really, I mean, it's just cool on its own. I think I literally saw it. Oh, Instagram I've used app. one of these, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's it's a very particular sound. It's again, talk about mid range, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's not gonna be versatile, but if it works, it can be really cool. Yeah, we blended this into drum drum recordings for a little extra kind of mid range. Yeah, but if you put it in front of the kit, it's like it's too much. Like when it's worked for me, I put it up in the ISO room facing like the corner, ah, and then so it's less compression, but right. Yeah, it's it's very it's got a very specific sonic imprint because it has a built-in compressor. It does look like a medieval torture device as well, or just the steampunk mic. Steampunk, yeah, and uh, medieval steampunk torture device. Let's see. That pretty much covers the fun stuff. Oh, this is actually a mic that I really love. Um, as, instead of an SM7, nothing against an SM7. Well, I don't like them, but lots of people do. But this is an AEA KU5A. We have one of those. They're wonderful on guitars, aren't yeah. they? And use it on scratch vocals, use it on guitars, use it on lots of different things. It's just, it's hypercardioid. Um, so you can use it in, like, I've used it for live band shoots and stuff in here for a vocalist. And just has some more character to it than an SM7. SM7 has its place and it's a very useful studio tool, but this actually has, I think, some character to it. Agreed. Wonderful mic. Great collection. Yeah. And then, all, yeah, just a bunch of other standards that are boring to talk about, but useful for any studio. 57s, 421s, KM184s, some M160s. Uh, M160s. We just got a Heiserman. Uh, Heiserman 251 to 251 oh, okay, clone. That's absolutely amazing, but it's being serviced right now. Uh, so we can show it off, yeah. but it's pro well, by right. far the best clone for a 251 I've ever heard. That's our newest mic that we just yeah. got. It's sad that it's not here today, but... Now we're heading to the Atmos realm. It's our newestly remodeled room. Newestly is not a word. Newestly? Oh, I like that. <laughs> oh, so it's all, all PMCs. <laughs> making up words. Great. I feel like it kind of works. Um, Newestly, I like it. I'll go with that. But it, it's been, we've been using it as an overdub room since 2016 when I first bought the studio. This was a, a monthly rental and uh, by a bunch of great different uh, guys and uh, James Eha from Smashing Pumpkins and Matt Mitchell who works with Pussifer and So James got rid of his Chelsea place? Yeah, yeah oh, this okay. is when he moved to LA oh, okay. and uh, he had, I think he had just sold his place when he moved in here and obviously a huge downsize. Maybe he still was running it, but Right around the same time. and um, But this was just as he was getting his footing out here. And anyway, so once in around 2015-16, we were busy enough to justify having an overdub room, a mix room, yep. and just, you know, we were, had more business than we could fit in the A room. And so that's when this desk went in here. This kind of footprint emerged. Yep. Um, it was a little different then. And, and all of this decor, the sort of... Uh, I don't know what it is, but I love it. Yeah, we were going for like a... Uh, great Gatsby. Yeah, Great Gatsby. Ah, kind of okay. Thing. Like a 20s... I see, yeah. Yeah. I call it the Great Gatsby spaceship with the Atmos speakers. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got very futuristic and... Is it Art Deco? Yeah, Art Deco. Okay. That was the word I was trying to think of. No, it's okay. I was trying to think of it too. It just came to me. And yeah, it's gorgeous. So for a while, it's just a stereo mix room. Actually, we could do surround in here as well. It was Adam... <laughs> we had a Adam S3X uh, left, center, right, and then... Adam A7X surrounds Beautiful. Uh, for 5.1. We still do lots of stereo mixing, stereo work, vocal tracking in here. Fantastic. That's primarily what we're still doing. And so it's a great space for that. Basic gear, just a really high-end vocal chain, having a BAE 1073 and a Tube Tech CL1B. Great. Stressor also is an option. Another Allen Smart um, down there. Does this tie line to any other rooms? It doesn't, um, but we could potentially, we have snakes and stuff that we could run if we ever wanted to right. do that. And the rooms do connect. Yeah, there's actually the, this door right here. You can connect between the two studios. So we've had oh, okay, cool. clients that book out both rooms, and then they can go back and forth without seeing the light of day, which some people like. And um, yeah, and it's just a, we, we still are running the, this, the D command, which is, in terms of a control surface, still great. Um, it, 
doesn't have all of the same functionality of an S4, S6, and that kind of stuff. But if you want to lay your hands on some faders, it's very functional for that. And it still speaks to Pro Tools nicely with the compressor and EQ section. Still all works. Um, but all the monitoring now, you know, but previously when it was a stereo room, we had monitoring going through a D command, yeah. uh, D mon, or X mon, sorry. Oh, so you, so you can pull this and push this out of the yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you can bring it down. Great. And, yeah. you know, sometimes, especially if people are concerned about the reflections and stuff, you can really kind of get, yeah. get it down there. Good. And have it be out of the way. Marvelous. And, uh, and then monitor controlling now with this DAD, uh, mom unit, the monitor module, monitor operating module. <laughs> And then, dad and mom, yes. mom and dad. And then we have source selection stuff. Can be all done through this, but it's nice to have it visually on the iPad. So this is where you can so, you know, select whatever source and which speaker combination you want to listen to. Lovely. Just a great little small room. The idea here was just to have something super vibey. Rooms with an Atmos setup and rooms like this typically don't have this kind of extra interior sure. detail. And so that was, you know, we can, all of the lights, we can change to all the different colors and we have them up now so that the cameras can see it. But um, you know, we can really, really set a cool vibe in here that's um, transports you away from whatever's happening on the other side of this wall. So, that's, excellent. That's really what's and and so we went with the PMC speakers. Uh, I was originally going to go a different direction and actually sat down and listened to them, and I was just pretty impressed by the way these sounds. Just really good low end, super sparkling high end. Of course, what when we were just listening to it, this room was tuned by Dolby. And so the curve, the Dolby curve is on them, which does have some high roll offs. When you take that off and listen to them, it, they really. I didn't really feel like there was any lack of high end. If anything, no, it's, it's very If pleasant. anything, I was like, this is quite bright. Yeah. Yeah. It goes even, it can go even brighter if you really need that detail. Yeah, I wouldn't imagine it needing to be brighter. Yeah, no. And then just NS10s, everything's running Dante, which is really cool when we have the two computer systems all Dante together. This um, receiver, which is what we were just listening on, is a Dante receiver, so we can listen to stuff like Apple Music and uh, from an uh, Apple TV, and there's one cable, or two cables going to this, an HDMI cable and an Ethernet cable, and we get 9.64 coming out of that room, which is what the speaker configuration is. Left, center, right, right. Uh, wide, left, right, sides, rears, uppers, and, uh, and then the four on top. And and then two two subwoofers which are just dual mono or single it's they're in serial and so it's just a a single LFE sub and then we can do, do a 2.1 configuration as well for mixing and marvelous you you can get pretty close to a main monitor sound with these speakers and the subwoofers it's you're not lacking for any so what technically is this it's a 914 914 yeah okay yeah, the, these these wides are the, what the you know bring it up from seven one. And usually, when you're looking at these meters here and you're seeing the playback, a lot of times the right wide and left wide aren't doing a lot, but they're for music getting used more and more. I think because just widening nice. the stereo image as opposed to putting stuff behind you is still really impactful. Amazing. Yeah, and that's pretty much the space. There's a vocal booth. Behind. That's what I was about to ask about. So there is a vocal booth in here. This is the vocal booth. You actually walk in through it, which is ah, I see. not the most ideal, but we we make sure it's uh, never interrupted. Yeah, absolutely. That makes we put in processes to make sure that... Hey, I've done drums in, in uh, smaller spaces than this. I mean, we've had amps and we've had string sections. We actually had a small little, like, four children choir in here. Nice. <laughs> you can make it work. Excellent. Yeah, and we have a little selection of mics that comes with this room, too. Um, our most recent one, we got the Stem C800 clone. Right. Um, that, that's pretty great. No, honestly, nobody has been able to tell the difference so far. Good. Because we also have an original C800 yeah. over at our other In location. In our other location, we have an so original. Did we, we did our shootout. There's, there's a mild difference in sound, but you would with any tube mic. Right. It's got the extended high frequency. Yeah. It's got that, and it's not harsh. Mm -hmm. And so... Would you like to see it? Yeah, absolutely. Let's bring the stem out. Yeah. Dimensionally, it, it really looks pretty much identical. There's a different badge, but the polarity, you know, selection is the same. And the size of the fin, there's another, you know, there's a, another couple companies doing, I feel like, recreations of these. There's the warm one, and it just has this tiny little fin. It's like guns. <laughs> Clients come in and they're like, we want the mic that looks like a gun. <laughs> <laughs> and like, there's other ones that have these, the little fin, and it's like, you got to have the whole... The mic that looks the like the gun. Yeah. 
Um, then, which of course I hadn't thought about until you said it, and now of course that's all I'm ever going to see. That's all you're ever going to see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 great on a lot of different things, but primarily hip hop vocals and female vocals. It's just got this really wonderful high end that cuts through without being obnoxious. So we also have a bunch of these guys laying around. Oh, okay. Uh, we have at least. One for each studio, and then we also have a floater for Channel One. That's kind of cool. You got somebody sitting behind you working on some beats, coming up with exactly. some ideas. I mean, we use yeah. these a lot where people come in and they want to work on Ableton or whatever, and right. you know, Ableton isn't really going to be compatible in this room with our system. And right. people just want their own rigs, their plugins, their instruments, and right. So, yeah, those the SSL little interfaces. I, I I definitely recommend those. So you both got unique backgrounds because you obviously assisted and intern. Did you intern at first? Uh, runner started as a runner. So you started runner, assisted at at Henson. At Henson, previously A and M. Previously A and M. Um, and you, of course, have run a whole bunch of studios in sunny Los Angeles. Yeah, but I also started as an intern and a runner. Oh, uh, at uh, Paramount. <laughs> yeah. Well, interned at a few places that no longer exist. Um, yeah, and a runner at Paramount, and then I went into management. I think it makes it her unique for her as a manager because she speaks the engineer language sure. fluently and is trained in that, went through yeah. it, and knows like what a session is like, whereas most studio managers have ideas, but she's been in the rooms and stuff during those sessions. I love the gear talk. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's great. It, it is. LA is, I don't know if it's unique in it, but LA has probably more women managing studios than men by about two to one. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Women, women run the industry. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Candace, obviously, at East of West is, is a force to be reckoned with. She yeah. is a force to be reckoned with, yeah. yes. Like yourself. I adore her. <laughs> what do you think of the industry at the moment? I mean, obviously, most people are coming in independently funded compared with label projects. Absolutely. And we, we gear towards the more indie artists. That's, uh, that's Eric's business model, is having a studio that is can go hand in hand with the biggest studios in town quality wise and gear wise, but we cater to the indie crowd and everybody in between. So we can have the high end label sessions and give them everything that they need, but also to the random band who have never been in the studio before. Right. Um, which we love. So are you, are you getting producers bringing in projects or are you, are you able to connect with the artist? It's usually artists directly right. as opposed to producers. I think a lot of producers will have their own home studios sure. nowadays. And then you have the artists who, we get a lot of sessions that are like jazz and big band and choirs. So they don't have their own spaces and they need a good quality space to come and work out of with good quality engineers. So Eric engineers himself, where he trained all, all of our staff. So everybody are very well versed with those types of sessions. How do you think you're fly, finding the clients? Now, obviously you've been in the industry, word, so word of mouth is a big thing, but any other means, social media, what's your? Mainly word of mouth here, but yeah, we do have our social media. We try to do like ads. We try to do specials when it's slow. So just reach out to our client base. But I don't think the ads and social, no advertising, either social media, print, whatever, and I, we've done it all. We've done it all. Produced results that are worth the money that you put into it, in my experience. Yeah, it's a difficult one. The one thing, though, we do have pretty good um, SEO on our website. So when you Google for recording studios, we show up, you know, first on the page, uh, especially in North Hollywood, we're like number one. Yeah. Now there's a bunch of like top 10 studios and like com these new manufactured websites by AI or whatever. But, <laughs> um, yeah, we, we have high rankings, and so I think a lot of people, when they're just new to the industry and they're Googling it, and they reach out, and we have a friendly studio manager answering the phone, somebody that can answer all their questions, that's different than the other places they're calling who may not have anybody on the phones, and sure. you got to call and wait for a call back, or it's somebody that's not going to give them the time of day because they're Joe Schmo from with their new band that they want to record a demo, and there's certain studio managers that will be like... Yeah, we're good, thanks. <laughs> Are you still going out to shows? Do you go to see shows? Do you go and... I go to as many shows as I can. Good. When I'm not here, I'm going yeah. to see live music. Right. But, I mean, this is, this is home. <laughs> but you go to shows and you connect with artists so they know where you work, they know what you do. If I can, for the most part, I think it's harder to access people at shows, who are with the crew. I'll try to talk to the sound people and get to the sound booth and be like, hey, if you guys are recording in town, here's a card. Right. Um, but I think there is less of that. And I think touring kind of post-COVID, mm -hmm. 
when everybody was suddenly on tour last year, it was just an insane wave of touring, and people were not really going to studios as much. Um, it was everybody who I talked to in the industry said the same thing. It's just been a little slower, and you know, everybody were just on tour, and nobody was in the studio. Yes, because they're so, making their money on the road. Yeah, they're exactly. Money on the record. Nobody was making new music. There, you'll are. notice there hasn't been a lot of new music last year. Yeah, sure. <laughs> or if they did, they during the pandemic, they had two or three albums worth oh, of stuff. Yeah. They just piled it on. They already had it piled up, so it was not. I would say touring has not been beneficial to studios um, in the last year, but it's definitely picking up now. I think people are coming back and yeah. are ready to be in the studio. What about doing like live performance video stuff in in the main room? Do you get that kind of work? Um, yeah, we do. We do a lot of music videos. It's a beautiful space. Having a loading dock in the back is great for productions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have space for production crews. Mm -hmm. You know, green rooms, we can do, you know, well, actually, we probably haven't shown them the back, but we have a pretty large, yeah, it was a large patio. patio and huge loading area. And so we can have craft services, all the extra cra uh, gaffers and all that stuff back there and out of the way. What's been interesting is I have, have you, you've experienced, you must have experienced what I'm about to explain now. Um, I have had many interns become successful. Mm -hmm. Eric has been with us 10 years. Uh, Phil Allen was one of my interns, went off and won a Grammy. Uh, I, there's a list of three, four people that have been interns that have gone off and won Grammys and stuff. But they've all stayed with me and worked with me for a long time. Mm -hmm. And quite often you get guys and girls come in and they intern with you. And then they go and get a job at like a, a big world-renowned studio to try and get a job with me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They, they're in these rooms and they, it's a really weird one because, do you know what I mean? Because they think there's some other yeah. career path. We've had a few people like leave, they're already assisting and engineering sessions here. Yeah. Doing great work and then they leave to be a runner. Yep. And a smaller Westlake studio. Somewhere else. And then they're looking back going, oh. And now they're not going to touch a mic, you know, or yeah. touch a console yeah. fader for another four years. Yeah. Um, I think that's the whole thing about, I think everybody knows and pays lip service to the industry being so different, mm -hmm. but the old ideas are still glued in there. There's still this sort of idea that an artist is picked up out of obscurity and dumped into a big pile of money. And, and even back in the 90s when I first started, you know, I was in bands and stuff like that, that wasn't like that. Yeah. There was no money pit of stuff. Yeah, ex things were expensive, but they pretty much let you make a record, and if it was crap... They wouldn't put it out, or they drop you, or, or both. Or they drop you, or both. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. never know. So yeah, either way, you have to work hard for it. Yeah. Even if, even if you have like, you know, nepotism in the industry, there are quite a lot of people who, they have the family money and they can start something. But if you're not good and you're not working hard on it, it's yeah. not going to go anywhere. Yep. There, there, there's no. It's not going to help you to be rich. You can't force people. You can't pay people to like your music, and you can't pay people to let you engineer for them because they're not going to use what you did. You have to work hard and you have to actually be good at your craft. Absolutely. I think one of the things we try and really focus on is removing some of the toxic elements of the industry, especially for the people starting out here. Because we both came up in major studios and have gone through the ringer. <laughs> yeah. What would you consider toxic? What? what? The attitude of, you know, if you're a runner, you have to go through hell in yeah. order to get somewhere. You are owned by the studio and you're disposable. We don't yeah. treat our team like that. Yeah. Our nice. team are valued and we appreciate them and we respect their time and their mental health. I So they only work 23 hours, <laughs> not 24. I mean, some of the people here just wrapped up a session at yesterday at 3 a.m. and they're here at 8. So there's, they're definitely still working hard, yeah. um, but... We're letting them know we're here, and we're not trying it. to put that, you know, we're trying to avoid these situations, but when we're busy, yeah. people pitch in because they know that we do value what they're doing and they want to help out. There's things that are beyond your control, though, aren't yeah. there? I remember yeah. coming in at Paramount for a, a session at 10 a.m., which is a normal kind of rock and roll time to start, and my assistant had just wrapped up a hip hop session yeah. like half an hour before in the same room. We walked in and it just stunk Smoke. of pot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I was is, doing that all the time when yeah. I was there. All of which is perfectly fine because I mean, what, you know, back in the sixties and seventies, that would have been rock and roll bands doing yeah. the same thing. So, but the point is, is like 
there's nothing you can do about that. No, there's nothing. And, you know, it's understandable. It's just a matter of, I think, attitude from management. Because when I was doing those things, it felt like a very thankless job. Mm -hmm. And I promised myself that whenever I manage a team, I will never make them feel undervalued or unappreciated. And everybody who work here started out as interns and moved up the ladder. Um, the only person who wasn't an intern at the studio first. Right. But I have you been through it. their process. Yeah. So I know what they're going through. And it is a point for us to make sure that they feel like they're getting something out of it and aren't just being used as studio slaves. Yeah. They get to use the studios yeah. after a certain amount of time. They're all trained by the runners, the paid runners. How do you get them to do that, though? Because every intern I've ever had, I'm like, you know, after hours, use your studio. I know. Well, I mean, we have a system. They have to request it. It's not. They can't well, just come in and use There's it. Some that no, are, but sometimes they just yeah. you give them the option, and they just sometimes don't they just off. don't. Yeah. It's fine. It's crazy though. But we we use that as information. For when it comes time to hire people, it's you know, like this person knows the room because they were in here at sure. 4 a.m. doing tracking drums, and that's the person that's going to get the gig. Yeah, yeah. That's, that was a good little tip, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. Yeah, if you, if you get an opportunity, take it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> for A, for the experience, obviously, but B, because it will show others, yeah. like yourselves, that you actually mean business. Yeah. We, we definitely pay attention to these things. And just a lot of collaborations. You're going to have an intern going to a senior intern like, hey, would you mind after hours listening to my mixes and giving me tips? Mm -hmm. And we notice that. We love seeing that, that hunger. They're actually trying to improve and get better. And that's just, I, I know for me, and I think Eric feels the same way, seeing people who we brought up succeed, that's like our success. Absolutely. When somebody leaves us for an opportunity that is you better. know truly better, that's we're wonderful. so happy for them. It's like okay, yeah, we lost that person, but we've got still great team coming up, yeah. and it's that's amazing that you know. Makes me think of certain things. I I remember um, I used to do a lot of vocal recording for Ryan Ryan Tedder, mm -hmm. and when he won his first Grammy, he texted me. And just say, like, thank you, you know, you did so much great work and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure I was one of 50 people he texted. Mm -hmm. But it meant a lot that those kinds of people get it, yeah. that they get it, you know. It, it does mean a lot. I, I, if, if I see somebody who came under me in some way doing well and I get to talk to them, it's always like, you gave me my first shot. It's like, well, I'm happy I did. Look at you now. This yeah. is great. You're all grown up. Yeah. It's really exciting. But you do have to suit up and show up, talking to the camera here, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to be there. There's no to. easy way. You have to stand out. Yeah, which is, which is sort of the tough one because sometimes it's doing... It's 22. <laughs> yeah, because you've got to do the hours, but you've got to do hours with great attitude and you've got to, you know, it, it's a tough one. Be seen but unseen. Yeah, like, how seen. do you show people how enthusiastic you are about it but also not be in the way and not be overbearing? And, you know, so it's... My personal experience role. is the 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 assistant that deals with a problem without making it into a, into a drama. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had, I've that used this tip. story a thousand times, so people were going to glaze over. But um, when we were doing, uh, we were at the Palms, which is uh, a, a great studio in, in, Vegas. in Vegas. But what happened was, is the AC went down in the control room, and that, that Neve they had in there, I think it was a V-series, would overheat really easily. Remember those Neves are sort of... Oh, yeah. And all the headphones went down. Oh, no. So I had a band and a kids' choir arriving to do a cover of do, um, um, Happy Christmas War Is Over. And uh, I didn't have any, any way of them hearing themselves. So I had to go out, to the, uh, out into the live room and ask them to adjust things, which nobody ever asked, why aren't you just hitting the talk back? Mm -hmm. I just would come out and I'd make light of it. And the, the, the assistant was just amazing did not once bring it up, didn't mention it in front of anybody, and we had the label there because at that point the band had sold like the biggest digital single ever. So everybody was all like, you know, being patting themselves on the back. And we had no way of them recording together because they wouldn't have been able to hear each other. And it finally got fixed and nobody knew. And I think that's a big measure of assistance because I've been in rooms where something goes wrong. Oh my God, I can't believe this. And you're like, shh. If, if the artist never finds out and we get it solved. Yeah, just fine. don't tell them. They don't need to know. Don't Everything's need to fine. Know. Let, let's do it again. You don't need to know. We just lost this take, but let's just do it again. I, I'm, I definitely won't mention anyone's like that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Always Warren. So to great you. to see you.
Thank you very congratulations. much. Congratulations. Oh, no, you've had it for 12 years now. 12 yeah, years we now. have you here. That's a congratulatory. Congratulations for getting a great manager. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So long, farewell, avidezen, au revoir, adios, ciao, goodbye.